I was taking a long drive down to Columbia this week and uh, I was listening to a podcast I listen to on occasion called Freakonomics. It looks at sort of the odder aspects of economics around the world and they brought up something very odd. They brought up houses in Japan. You see, houses in Japan, we, we tend to think of them, they, they look like, put up that first slide, that's what we'd expect houses in Japan to look like, right? We'd expect them to look very classical, very Asian, and that's not actually what they look like at all. Some of the weirdest houses in the world show up in Japan. I, I, I did a Google Im image search for houses in Japan. I didn't look up weird houses, strange houses, I just looked up houses in Japan. And these are the houses I found. That, let's, that's a bit odd. That's even weirder. That's a two-story house in, in the space where we wouldn't even put a shed. Go ahead to the next. That's got an at the angle. That, that's nice. I'm not quite sure what they're getting at there. They do, kind of. That's one of my favorites. That's, uh, if you look at it, you can see the, the, what guards the, the door. The front door is the chimney of the house that's on its side. Go ahead and the next one. I, I don't know where you would put a closet and where you would change, but that's really cool. Next. Same problem here. Go ahead to the next one. That didn't show up very well, but that is a house in a tree. It's a tree house, really. Next. That's pretty cool. You could, I could see that on, like, on a beach in Florida or something like that. Next. That, uh, also a little bit odd. Next. Okay, so though there were many more. I just picked a couple that kind of struck my fancy. It turns out, if you are in Japan and you are an architect, you can just play. You want to do something weird, you will find someone to pay you to build a funky and weird house. Now, we all know Japan is an island, so you might wonder, where are they building all these new houses? They are building new houses every day. Where are they putting them? Well, they're knocking down the old ones. You see, in Japan, they knock down houses left and right. In America, when do we knock down a house? We don't. I mean, we have houses in this town that have been condemned multiple times. They're still standing, aren't they? Right? We don't knock down houses in America. They last forever. In Japan, the half-life of houses, 30 years. Half of all houses in Japan are, are newer than 30 years. They knock down houses because they depreciate in value. A 30-year-old house is worth zero dollars. Houses depreciate in value. It, it, it sounds dorktacular to talk about it, but just think about what that means for a minute. Like in America, the way the middle class builds wealth, what do you do? You buy a house, you pay the mortgage, you have an asset with defined value that grows in value, then you have equity, right? It's all about, you gotta have equity. In the, and you pay off the 30 year fixed mortgage, and then you have this asset. It's like a forced savings plan. You have now saved this chunk of money. And in Japan, you buy a house, it's like buying a car. The second you drive it off the lot, it's worth less. The second you finish a house, it's worth less. So that by the time it's 30 years old, it's worth nothing. And so when you sell and move, you don't sell the house, you sell the land, and then someone has to pay to demolish the house, and they put up a new one. And so, what happens? It, 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 what happens is, if you know that your house, no one else is ever going to live in it, and you're going to build a new house, what type of house do you build? whatever you want. You want to build something funky that looks like it's upside down? Great, go for it. You want to build a tree house, the tree house you've always wanted? Go for it. I mean, so you just build whatever type of house you want. What started this? Well, two things happened. First, that happened. World War II, when uh, before there were two atomic drums backed up, dropped on Japan, there was also extensive bombing by B-29s. And, and a large amount of the housing in the country simply went poof. So there was no housing. And so what happened was they had to rebuild quick. You got to put people somewhere and they re built really cheap housing. No insulation, heavy tile ceilings, just cheap shacks and shanties. And then something else happened. 
earthquakes. Japan gets more earthquakes than any other part of the world. And so there was a massive earthquake in 1950. And so after everything is rebuilt following World War II, you rebuild cheap because you have to get everyone housed. And then you, you, knock, you knock it down to replace it because you have to build something safer because of the earthquake. And then building codes start to drive this. The building code would, would, would say you have to build it like this to make it safe. And so people would knock down a house to build a safer house. Because can you hear the commercials about buy, build, building a safe house to protect your family? It's like our modern uh, home security commercials. You can just imagine those, the way it talks, safety of your family, finest building materials. And so what has happened is, uh, you can go to the next slide, what has happened is uh, houses have become disposable. You're always buying the next house, the better house, the more unique house, the house that's exactly what you want and no one else is going to want it and so when you're done with it, you, someone else knocks it down and builds a new one. A weird situation, isn't it? The Old Testament gives explicit guidance on how to own slaves. It tells you if you are to own a slave, if it is a Hebrew slave, you are to own them for six years and then let them be free. If a it says in Deuteronomy, if a member of your community, whether a Hebrew man or Hebrew woman, is sold to you and works six years, in the seventh year you set them free and you do not send them out empty-handed. You provide out of your flock, your threshing floor, your wine press, thus giving him some of the bounty which the Lord has given you. And if for some reason you haven't freed a slave after that many years, every 50th year we, you hit the year of Jubilee. And everyone must be freed on the year of Jubilee in the same time that everyone reverts to the original land rights and, and all of that. Now, if you were a foreigner who owned a slave, it was a bit different. If you were a foreigner who owned a slave and owned a Hebrew slave, the, the, the family could always come to you and buy out their slavery. Because if there were so many years till they were going to be free, you could say, well, they're going to be free in four years. How much are they making for you a year? Okay, I'll pay you four times that and free them right now. And so there had to be a way to get them out of jail, so to speak. If you were a foreigner in slavery, you could be in slavery forever, but that didn't happen very often because the only way to get those type of slaves were in conquest, and Israel didn't tend to go out conquesting often. Now, if you were a thief, you could end up in slavery because if you stole an ox, you had to pay back five oxen. But if you stole a sheep, you only had to pay back four. I don't know why it was a different ratio. But if you couldn't make good on the, on the four sheep, then you could be put into slavery to pay off your debt. Um, and, and there were some protections built, it, built in, like if you were a woman who was in, enslaved and, and the, your master decides to marry you and then decides, eh, I really don't like her. You can't get rid of her. You, you, you can't look over her children in inheritance. You can't ditch her and put her out on the street. And, and so there are these various forms of, of slavery in, in the Old Testament, depending on whether you're a Hebrew uh, or a, a foreigner. Um, and everyone, ha no matter what, no matter what type of slave you were, you had the Sabbath day off. Everyone gets the Sabbath day off. But, but slavery in the Old Testament, it's a little bit complicated, but it's there. Jesus has nothing to say about it. Probably because to own a slave meant that you had wealth, and Jesus was not hanging out with a lot of people with wealth. The most you can say, if you really get at it tangentially, you could say, uh, Jesus talks about John 3.16, the Son of God gave his only begotten Son so that all, not free, not sl but all, including slaves, might believe and, and have eternal life. So Jesus does come for all people. But if you want to get into what the New Testament says about slavery, what you have to look at are the letters of Paul, where Paul has to give advice to these new churches trying to follow Jesus. What are we going to do about owning slaves? We're in the Roman Empire. It's legal to own slaves. And so Paul gives some advice in different places in the letters, saying things like, this is Ephesians 6, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling not only while being watched in order to please them, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God. Render service with enthusiasm, and masters do the same. Stop threatening them, for you know that you both have the same master in heaven, and with him there is no partiality. And so there is this idea of benevolent slavery that Paul kind of pushes. Be nice to your slaves. Masters, don't be jerks. Slaves, do the work you're supposed to. 
But then what is weird about this is Paul then gives some later... Uh, he doesn't only give this advice on how to run your household. He also says multiple times that he uses this refrain. He talks about, there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This is a refrain he comes to multiple times. In Colossians, he says again, in the renewal that comes in Jesus Christ, there is no longer Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all in all. He says it again in Romans, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. And so what we end up with in the New Testament is this very interesting situation where you have the, the, the guidance on how to run your house, be nice to your slaves, masters, be nice to your slaves, slaves do what you're told, but also Paul talking about how in Christ there is no such thing as Jew or Greek, male or female, slave or free. That's not what we see. That's not what matters to us. And, and so in Paul, there is this very interesting tension. It's kind of a weird situation, isn't it? I've just described these two very weird situations that probably don't seem connected to you. Housing in Japan that depreciates and is knocked down, and, and the Bible condoning slavery in this way that we just, we think is kind of odd. It would seem like we would have a bet, we have a, be a sense of a better way to live, that you should take care of houses instead of tearing them down, and that we treat people all as people, and, and no one should be a slave. But when we look at such a challenging and weird situation, how do you change it? How do you make sense of it? How do you go, go in and make a difference? Let's start with Japan. If you wanted to say to Japan that there's a better way to live, that you know a 30-year-old house is still worth quite a bit, it's just, it's just kind of broken in. I mean, at that point, it's only going up in value. If you wanted to change that situation, what would you do? Well, you'd get together some money, and you'd go to Japan and start buying old houses, right? Go buy up a whole bunch of old houses, you'd get them cheap, and hold on to them. And, and then over time, they would probably be in it. Well, here's the problem. You ever hear, for every problem, there is a simple, elegant, and wrong answer? That, that's the wrong answer. You just can't go in and, and start buying up houses. Because, well, if you know that your house is not going to be owned by anyone else, not only do you design your house to be exactly what you want it to be, if you know that as soon as you move out, it's going to be demolished, do you take care of it? Do you ever repaint it? Your kids move out and go to college and their, their toilet stops, fi stops working. Do you fix the toilet? If you're in Japan, and even if you wanted to fix the toilet, where would you go to buy one? There is no Home Depot. Think about that. There is no Lowe's. There's no Home Depot. There is. I could go to the, a local hardware store. I could go to Kirksville. And I could buy every single piece of lumber or, or gadget or piece of metal I needed to rebuild my entire house. You can't do that in Japan. There aren't the stores there. Because there's not the demand. No one's repairing their houses because they're going to get knocked down. And so if you wanted to change this situation, it would not be as simple as just going in and buying some, some old houses, would, would you? Because what happens is, when you don't take care of a house, when it should have been painted at 15 years in, and you don't paint it, what happens 15 years after that? Things have started to rot, haven't they? And so if you don't take care of a house for 30 years, how long does it last? 30 years. So, what's, what, if, you wanted to make a, if you wanted to go in there and, and change this, it would not be as simple as just going in, buying up some old houses, and, and holding on to them. You'd have to do something far more challenging. What you'd have to do is get together a group of people, all of us here. We could say, well, let's all go to Japan. And let's just imagine we can all speak the language. Let's all go to Japan, and let's build houses, and build them for the long haul. Instead of building the house like everyone else is building, building weird, funky houses that are on their side, or all black on an angle, or just build a normal house. And then all of us, as a community, let's learn to take care of our houses. And that might mean we're going to have to import some things. We're going to have to call back to the states and, and call the Lowe's in Kirksville and say, hey, 
I'm in Japan, I need a toilet. Help. And it would be challenging. You'd have to do some things that would be weird. And it would look really weird when you went to work on Friday and someone asked, so what are you going to do with yourself this weekend? And you would say, well, I thought we'd paint our house. If no one else in the community is doing that, what type of response do you think you'd get? What type of weirdo are you? Why are you putting all that money into your house? You're crazy. You're not normal, are you? And you'd have to say, you're right. I'm not want to join me and go paint your house. It, but what would happen is a group of people committed to living differently can begin to show people that what they're doing is not weird, but what they're doing makes sense. It just takes a while to show them. How long would it take to show someone that a house could last more than 30 years? It'd take at least 30 years, right? It would take a while. Okay. What if you were Paul and you wanted that you are realizing that there's a challenge in front of you, that you're inheriting all these things about slavery, how to be a slave, how to do slavery, how to govern slavery, but then you're also realizing that in, in Christ Jesus, there is no such thing as free or slave, Jew or Greek, uh, male or female, that all of that is cast aside, that we are all equal before God, and we need to figure out how to learn how to live like that. What would you do? What could you do? You could send out a letter to every Christian and say, free all your slaves. Is that going to work? That would be about as effective as the Japanese government sending everyone a letter and saying, take care of your houses. Yeah, right. What, what could you do? Well, what you could do is, if you run into someone like Onesimus, a slave who happens to be connected to a church that you love dearly, you could send that slave back and say, this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity. This is not just one random slave who ran away. This, this might be part of God's plan. I'm going to send him back. And I'm going to recommend that this church leader, Philemon, this leader in one of the major churches in the burgeoning Christian movement, free him. Not because it makes sense to anyone else. Because the Roman culture, you don't free slaves. The Roman Empire still has slavery. But I'm going to recommend that, that Onesimus be freed. And then what happens after that? What happens when a, a church takes a stand and says, we're going to free this slave. And what happens to Philemon at work the next day? He goes to work the next day and they say, hey, I heard you freed your slave. And, and they're going to ask, wait a minute, you paid good money for that slave. And what's Philemon going to say? In Christ Jesus, there is neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. And to someone who's not a Christian, you know what that's going to sound like? I'm crazy. How long would it take to show that they're not crazy? Well, Onesimus, what happens? He becomes a leader in the church, and then eventually what happens to him? He becomes bishop of, uh, of another church, of Ephesus. And so it was a long-term haul. It took a while for Paul, uh, Paul suggested, free this slave, be the church that can embrace a slave that is freed, and see what happens. And see what happens. I think that's what it takes to make a change in anything that's important. Yes, it would have been nice if Paul could have just said, everyone free your slaves, that's that. But I think what he does here, sending back one slave to be freed in one church by a leader of the church, begins a change in that church that we know has fruit down the road. And I think that shows us part of what we are called to do as well. We are called to follow Jesus, to follow Jesus first. We are followers of Jesus before we are American, before we are Missourian, before we are Republican, before we are Democrat, before we're male, female, slave, free, Greek, Jew, before we're of any ethnicity. We are Christian before we are anything else. And that shapes everything else. And that makes us look kind of weird. Last week, I told you Philemon raises two questions. The first was, as an individual reading this, can we imagine with Philemon seeing people differently? Because Philemon is challenged to see Onesimus not as a slave, but as a brother. And can we in the same way imagine others as people who can also come and follow Jesus with us, even if they have never been to church before? The second question Philemon leaves us, though, is a question for us as a community. 
How do we live in tension with the culture around us? The culture, when we look at the culture around us and they look at us, there are going to be times that we say the same thing of each other. We think the culture around us is weird. And they're going to look at us and say, no, you're weird. And that, that's what it means to be part of, of the church. We are people called to be weird, to do very weird things like see all people as children of God, not illegal aliens. Like rebuking a culture that sees greed as good and condones inequality such that our economics is leading to the point where the fastest growing group in poverty are the elderly. That's not good. We stand up and say so. We are, the ch as a church, we are the group that learns to argue in a way that respects each other and confesses, I might be wrong, but let's work this out. When's the last time you heard a confession by a politician? At the church, that's what we do every week. We confess. And we say, this is how we do things here. We're Christians. And if you look at us and you say, well, you're weird, then, no, you're weird. You're the ones doing it the way that we don't think works. We're following Jesus, and this is what works for us. And so if you ever, have ever heard a sermon, read some part of the Bible, spent some time in prayer, and got up afterwards and thought, you know, if I did what I think I just heard God telling me to do, that, that people would look at me like I'm weird, well, yes. That's exactly the case. We are called to be a community that lives weird. And to live by the weird ways of Jesus Christ until the rest of the world catches on that this is the right way to live. And that might be in our lifetimes. It might be down the road. It might not be till kingdom come. But we are called to be the people who are weird. And one of the ways that we know that we are being faithful and following Jesus is in when we explain what we're doing someone and look, someone looks at us and says, I don't quite get that. That's weird. And then we say, exactly. Amen.